Hello, you are listening to the Capsule in Conversation podcast dedicated to women and their well-being. I'm Natalie Anderson and today I'm joined by Sarah Graham, journalist and author of the hugely successful book Rebel Bodies to talk the gender health gap, politicizing women's bodies and challenging the concept of hysteria. So sit back, relax and get ready to join us in our conversation. Hello all, thank you so much for tuning in. I am absolutely thrilled to be welcoming today's guest as her incredible book, Rebel Bodies, completely blew me away when I read it. In fact, I came away feeling that it should actually be digressed in every single secondary school in the country. With huge praise from both readers and the media, the book has been labelled as eye-opening and a manifesto into the health revolution. With Stylist Magazine regarding it as crucial reading for us all. She's also the founder of the hysterical women blog which looks to explore the sexism paternalism dismissal and disbelief surrounding women's health care she is the brilliant sarah graham hi sarah hello thank you for having me oh no thank you so much i mean that was quite a big introduction in the sense of just all the things that you do and all of the incredible work that you've clearly been doing like over the last five years at least and beyond with Rebel Bodies itself as a book, I mean, here is the book. And as I've just said, it it's such a game changer and it's absolutely amazing. But what I also didn't say was that you've also become a mum in that time. Yeah. How on earth has that been? It's been, been a busy couple of years. <laughs> like juggling though, like pregnancy and postpartum whilst, you know, having your head in this project. How, how has that been for you? Yeah, it's been... It's been a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest. So I wrote the book while I was pregnant, uh, took a few months off, obviously, to have the baby. And um, at that point, just kind of handed everything over to my publishers, let them kind of do all of the behind the scenes stuff, editing and typesetting and design. Um, But yeah, it's been, I honestly, it's been exhausting. Um, (laughs) But it's it's been so exciting. It's been a really incredible couple of years. Um, I feel like I've kind of made two babies at once. Yeah, I mean, and in it's, it's them out into the world. And you must be thrilled with the reaction as well that you've had. Yeah, it's been really, really lovely so far. I was kind of, I think, particularly as a journalist, perhaps I often kind of brace myself for negative reactions, for trolling, for criticism, um, and. I mean, touch wood, there's, there's been pretty much nothing so far. Um, I had one email from a male doctor uh, who hadn't read the book and wanted to tell me that I was wrong. <laughs> but um, but otherwise, it's, it, you know, it's been absolutely lovely. It's been really nice. It's been so heartening. And I've had so many amazing conversations with readers at events and on Instagram and, you know, all over the place, just talking about their own experiences and what they took from the book and you know, the the perspectives that were in the book that they'd never even considered before. Um, yeah, it's been it's been absolutely mind blowing. I've I'm really thoroughly enjoying the whole process. I mean, as like a bit of a, a summary, it can't be a summary really, because it's really hard to summarize kind of <laughs> what the book is. But in terms of you know, each chapter is dedicated to an area of 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 health, shall we say. And yeah. and And you really dive into it really deeply. You know, you're going back to the historical historical content and and context of it. And then also just um, case studies, you know, people's experiences and then backing that up with scientific work. And in each chapter, as I said to you just before we popped on, that, you know, you kind of need to digress each one for like you can't just read it all the way through or or you can but then you kind of go, oh, I need to go back and read that again. That level of research, I mean... Did you just feel like once you started down kind of a path with each particular aspect, you felt more and more impassioned? Because the stories that really come out to me, I, f- I can almost feel you just wanting to get this onto the page. Did Is that how it was? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the book really very much grew out of uh, my blog, Hysterical yeah. Women. And um, so what Hysterical Women kind of started out as was a place to curate women's stories, um, and, and essentially their experiences of feeling that they were dismissed or not taken seriously in healthcare. 
Um, and I suppose over the pandemic, really, um, where, where, you know, it was such a kind of mad time of where where health really was kind of at the forefront of everybody's minds. Mm. And we were talking about it so much more and the way that, you know, everybody else's health impacts on each other's and the, the kind of politics of health and, you know, public health and private health. And it was all kind of mingled together. And I just thought, I want to be able to put these stories into context mm. um, because that was, you know, that was all the blog was, was a collection of stories presented without context. Mm. And I wanted really to have a kind of longer form space to be able to say this is why it happens you know this is these are kind of some of the historical reasons this is the evidence that it happens this is the impact it has on on real people these are kind of the human faces and stories behind it um but also i really wanted to celebrate some of the advocacy work that mm. i have been so inspired by just through kind of being you know becoming part of these communities online and chatting to people and seeing what they were doing to I suppose you know bring something positive out of their experiences so yeah it it I felt like there was kind of so much in my head and I wanted it to be comprehensive I wanted it to be nuanced because I've felt frustrated in the past that a lot of stuff around the gender health gap only focuses on you know sexual and reproductive health or it yeah. only focuses on white middle class women's experiences I wanted it to be much more much bigger and to be able to you know drill into the finer detail but also have a much bigger picture understanding of the issue and how deeply entrenched it is and and that really comes across like that really really comes across like you say and I think from your you know we'll we'll talk about like hysteria you know that that first kind of section where you were discussing you know the the word hysteria and, and how it kind of correlated with women's wombs and how then later on you know we we've become hysterical women anything that's to do with your hormones or it's it's witchcraft it's all this stuff and you know as I was reading it I was like oh my god and I was getting more and more across <laughs> but then you like you said I can see how you'd started the blog in that kind of space and going um you know particularly like with women's reproductive health but then when you move across into you know like black women's experiences and people of color and really like you know the fact that P black women's pain isn't you know for some people isn't recognized or or kind of you know it, it, people have been made to feel like oh you, you're imagining it and yeah. when you really go into it in the historical context of it and why this happened and it's so it's it's not shocking because actually we do know these things existed but the way that it still presents itself in modern day society for me I was like what and this absolutely is still happening. And we hear it, you know, with um, women of colour in, in childbirth and their experience and postpartum and they're disbelieved. And you're really holding up a mirror to all of that, which I think many of us kind of just, unless we're experiencing it ourselves, we don't really get it. Yeah. You know, for, for you personally, exploring that area. And like you said, you'd worked with various communities. H has, it, has it kind of... Um, Oh, oh, lifted a lid on that area has it you know got more conversations going yeah I mean I think that's that's partly what I what I was inspired by in the first place was that the conversations that I was seeing were growing and I wanted mm. to be able to tap into that I wanted to be able to kind of almost use that as a bit of a catalyst for furthering the conversation because you know people kind of it, talk about the book as if this is my revolution it's not my revolution mm. I'm just here documenting it you know this revolution has already started people have been laying the groundwork advocates activists campaigners have been laying the groundwork for this for years um and what I want the book to do is you know to kind of shine a light on that work the work that's already been done to inspire people who you know, perhaps are not yet involved to get involved in whatever way works for them. Mm. And just to feel that they're not alone, to know that there are people out there fighting their corner, to know that there are people out there who have been through similar experiences um, and that change is coming. You know, there are people out there who want to make this better and there are, is a growing conversation that people can be part of. And it's all, it's, like I said, it's in so many different um, areas, you know, trans people and women that are in the menopause or you've put it in one of the chapters, neurotic mothers. Oh my gosh, when I was reading that, I was like, 
how many times myself personally have I had to almost beat the door down to say to the doctor, I know my child, there's something wrong and I am insisting that you examine him. I'm insisting that, and you, because, and that you just feel like you've been made to feel like you're mad or yeah. like you're being a, a hypochondriac. And you yeah. think, I know my own child, I'm not stupid. And these labels have, have been have, have us been made to feel like we're stupid or being humiliated. And it's happening across the board. And you know, it but when you've put it all together in the book, it's like this is not just one area. This mm. is across the board, like everywhere. I mean, for you, you know, being a new mum, what has been your experience of of your like healthcare kind of, obviously, I mean, we don't want to completely like bash the NHS or anything like that. (laughs) But at the same time, we do have to kind of, you know, shine a light on it, like you say, so that we can improve. What's been your experience? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, my experience has been, you know, for the most part, fairly positive. Um, I certainly went into it, I think, you know, because I was writing this book at the time, I I went into it quite defensive and quite sort of prepared Mm. to to fight my case. Um, And actually, for the most part, the experiences that I've had have been positive. Um, I have been very lucky in that I had a very straightforward pregnancy, very straightforward birth, very straightforward postpartum. And my child, although, you know, he's had all the kind of endless snotty noses and colds and viruses and everything since he started nursery like other than that his health has been fine so I have you know there haven't been particular issues where I've had to fight my case um which you know obviously helps you know I think for people who are generally well and just going through the through the healthcare system without complications mm. it can you know it can be a much more positive experience i think where often we see those difficulties is like you say when something does go wrong and yeah there's that doubt and 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 that questioning and you know this idea that some people are more trustworthy than others that some people can be believed more readily than others mm. um but yeah as as far as my own experience i i haven't really got any complaints you know i i and and I say in the book, as you know, that I'm very pro NHS. I, you know, I don't want this book to be about bashing doctors or individuals. You know, I want it to be about highlighting the systemic issues here and showing, you know, where structural change needs to happen. Um, you know, there are some really fantastic healthcare professionals in the NHS and, and they need the support to improve things um, just as much as patients do. But it's like you, you know, you pointed one out in 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 the book, Doctor Nikat Arif, who I love, and if you follow her on she's TikTok, amazing. she's absolutely amazing, and she's doing so much work for women's health and women's reproductive health as well. Hopefully, she's coming on here soon. And um, but she's, I mean, again, it, it's 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 allowing doctors, I suppose, as well to have that Doctor Amir Khan's another one where they can use what they have and use that platform to try and actually reach people and you know rather than just those one-to-one kind of GP sit down you've only got so many minutes you know face to face that that's such a huge issue isn't it like the backlogs and the queues so doctors are trying to find new ways to be able to pass on education and reach people um you know what what do you think of that whole kind of social media Media explosion and you know because it can be quite dicey as well can't it yeah I think you know I think it's great and I think as you say there are some fantastic doctors out there really using it as a tool for public health and for raising awareness I think one of the things that social media is really kind of crying out for is good quality evidence-based mm expert information because there are so many people out there who are presenting themselves as experts who don't have the qualifications who don't know what they're talking about who are you know selling some expensive product or solution or cure or whatever that actually isn't evidence-based and isn't regulated um so i think it's really positive that we have these healthcare professionals who you know work ridiculously long hours i don't know <laughs> i don't know where they find the time or the energy i know they've got families you know i'm nigga in particular i'm just like when do you sleep woman? <laughs> but you know it's it's amazing and they are doing such good work and it's so important you know particularly for Nigat because she's reaching out to South Asian communities yeah. where 
you know, there are so much stigma around talking about these issues within the family. And and she talks about like going viral on family WhatsApp groups where people are like sending her TikTok videos to their aunties and things. And I just think that is amazing and so powerful and so important a resource for people who, you know, perhaps are not getting that information from anywhere else. You know, we're not getting it in school, that's for sure. Or I certainly didn't. Um, and like you say, doctor's appointments are so short. It, it really helps mm. if you can go in kind of already equipped with a bit of knowledge, a bit of understanding about what might be going on with you. Well, that's something that I think is so interesting in the book as well, how you have like this toolkit and resources, you know, at the end of each chapter you've got, right, okay, if you if you want help on these issues, these are the places that you need to go to. Was that important to you to kind of empower people? Yeah, definitely. I wanted the book to be practical. Um, it's one of the things that people, ever since I started the blog, really have asked me is you know what can I do to to advocate for myself better how can I get doctors to listen to me and you know I mean I, I give the caveat in the book that we shouldn't have to the onus shouldn't be on patients to, mm. to fix this and I don't think patients on their own can fix it um, but at the same time I think you know there are things you you can do to make life easier for your doctor, for example, by going in with symptom diaries, by being able to present the information in a really concise and sort of ordered, structured way so they have a really clear picture of what's been going on for you. Um, but yeah, it, it did feel important to give people, and I think a lot of it is about confidence. It's about empowering mm. people with the knowledge that their expertise is valid as well it's a different kind of expertise from the expertise their doctor has but you know you're the only person that lives in your body you know it best than anyone like you were saying about your child you know your child better than anyone you know your body better than anyone so if you know that something isn't right chances are something isn't right and and you know you don't necessarily know what that is but I think we're so used to the kind of patient doctor dynamic being mm you know, doctor knows best and they're the expert and you kind of defer to them. But actually, I think what we need is much more of a partnership. And mm -hmm. so that's what I try to get across in those toolkits is this is how you can work with your doctor to, you know, try and find a solution, try and figure out what's going on collaboratively as a partnership. Um, and if that's not happening, if you found a doctor who is just not interested, who is defensive, who isn't listening, who doesn't care, you can make a complaint you can ask for a second opinion you you know you have rights you don't have to just kind of roll over and accept it well we've been doing a lot of on this actually and I know you've covered it in the book as well um with the lovely Diane Dansbrink who we've had on here too is you know especially women going through like perimenopause and menopause and younger women um you know we kicked off this this particular series with Dr Naomi Potter talking about the perimenopause mm -hmm. and how a lot of her patients are like 40 41 42 and they're all saying the you know, most GPs, I suppose, uh, or people that, sh uh, patients that she's getting are saying, my doctor's told me I'm too young for this. My doctor's telling me I'm too young. And it's so problematic because you're just finding so many women are being misdiagnosed. They're being given like antidepressants or other medication because it couldn't possibly be perimenopause. And actually it is. And so, you know, women are being sent down on a wrong track. And it isn't just women, obviously. There's so many issues across the board. But this particular issue, which I know you spoke to Diane about, the fact that she wasn't even told really when she went in to have her ovaries removed that she was going to go into surgical menopause. Mm -hmm. I mean, what even, what is that? <laughs> I, know. I know, I think you know menopause is a really interesting one because obviously it's having a huge moment at the at, at mm. the moment and, and we're seeing so much more conversation about it which is fantastic but I think for years and years and decades even there has been so little information um you know patients themselves don't know they they're mm. taken by surprise when it happens to them because no one tells you that it can start in your 40s you know doctors GPs don't have enough education don't have enough training around menopause and I think you know it is a, it's a huge problem because it means that people are effectively not being diagnosed until they're post menopause um you know not getting the treatment they need and mm. and it you know the impact of that is huge when you look at the impact on people's jobs their family lives their relationships it's just it's so frustrating um you know so I think again it's so important that we're now having this conversation that we're telling people this is what happens you know and 
because for so long we've had this stereotype. I mean, if you look at like, I'm sure you've done this for things you've worked on. If you look at the stock images of women in menopause, yeah. they're like gray haired grannies, you know, it's women in their seventies. And, and that's just not, you know, that's not the case, but that is kind of the cultural image and expectation mm -hmm. that we have. Um, and, and that just isn't the reality. So we need to kind of shift that whole conversation about what menopause looks like, about what so many of these conditions look like. Um, because actually, you know, the, the face of menopause and the experiences that people go through are so varied and so diverse and we cannot keep treating it as a kind of one size fits all. And I think it goes back to what you were saying, you know, like in the earlier parts of the book where you talk about kind of the history of women's health. And again, going back to hyster hysterical women and, you know, once you're past the reproductive phase, you're kind of redundant and all that systemic kind of uh, narrative being part of our everyday life and and you know that's what I love again when you know I was looking into why you'd called the book rebel bodies as opposed to hysterical women and it's kind of like this fight back I suppose of people going actually no I'm not putting up with this and I think we are in that phase now I know here we're definitely trying to change the narrative around menopause and perimenopause and what that looks like and who who is the face of that well there is no face of perimenopause menopause because it can you know so many women deal with it differently or it reaches them at different ages some women are much younger in their kind of late 30s or or you know that would be like premature menopause and some women are older but it, it's not a, like you said it's not a one size fits all and we do really have to get rid of that kind of narrative so that we can actually this next phase of our lives live it feeling inspired and empowered and as you were saying before you know when we feel like that that filters out into the rest of society and you know very much that comes across in the book is that if you fix these things you're gonna fix the society you know what I mean if you get these areas sorted out and you are more compassionate in the way that you deal mm -hmm. with people you don't humiliate people you don't disbelieve people that, that, that has benefits for the whole of society when you yeah. think about you know the impact on families if mothers are, you know feel more able and more energetic and more well to spend time with their children and you know it has an impact on businesses if female employees are you know able to thrive and and feel their best and and really you know fulfill their potential it has a massive impact on the economy you know there are so many kind of even if you don't you know even if you don't care about women per se the financial incentive for fixing this is massive because it's mm. such a false economy to not deal with it um yeah, I just think there there are so many reasons why why we need to tackle this, um, and and so many reasons why it would just improve everything for everyone. There's not a single person on the planet who couldn't benefit from closing the gender health gap. A hundred percent, absolutely. I mean, if we go back to the beginning of like the hyster hysterical women blog. Tell me what it was. What was the impetus for you kind of wanting to start that in the first place? So it was, there was one article in particular that I wrote for Stylist about five years ago um, about a woman with endometriosis. And she had had symptoms since she was 13, basically since her period started. Um, and her mother had, had had endometriosis. And so they were fairly sure that was what it was. They went to the doctor. They were told, no, 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 it's nothing. All girls have bad periods. This is normal. You know, pain is just what should be expected um, and they said that her mother had put this idea in her head um, and, and that she, she was basically trying to copy her mum and it took 10 years for her to be diagnosed by the time she was diagnosed obviously she did have endometriosis um, and it had done permanent damage to her bladder um, it was also kind of around her bowel think there'd been some kind of long-term damage there as well um and she said you know we were made we were treated like hysterical women we were made to feel like we were overreacting that we were making a big deal about this and it just got me so angry um and kind of over the months that followed I noticed that I was hearing similar sorts of things in interviews with women about other subjects so you know, it wasn't just about kind of reproductive or menstrual health, but it was coming up in all sorts of different areas. And that was what I, where I kind of thought, yeah, I need to do something 
because the thing that really struck me was all of the women I was speaking to spoke about feeling isolated. They felt alone. They thought they were the only one going through this. Um, and I wanted to prove that they weren't, essentially. Um, so, th so that was kind of what inspired the blog initially, was just to say, you are not alone. This is happening to loads of women. Um, and, it, you know, to, to basically to prove a point, uh, I suppose. Um, and it just really grew from there. And I was amazed by kind of the breadth and depth of stories that people submitted. And like you said, there's just there are there are it's across so many different areas of health, so many, whether it's, you know, people going in and what really gets me is, you know, we're told go and get checked out, go and get checked out. You know, if you've got if you feel like, oh, you could have a lump or whatever or this, go and get checked out. And nine times out of 10, yes, you know, you will be dealt with properly and fairly. But then there are other times where, like you say, you just made to feel like you're overreacting. And, you know, it taught me through because I just want our listeners to to hear the concept of the the word hysterical because you know and the fact that why you've chosen that word and how that that word correlates to kind of our um the idea of women's health and our hormonal health. Yeah. So hysteria has a really fascinating history. Um so the idea of hysteria is about 6000 years old. It comes from ancient Greece. Um, and hysteria itself comes from the Greek word for womb. And essentially, ancient civilizations had all kinds of weird and wonderful ideas about women's bodies. But, you know, essentially, because women were viewed as uh, mothers, as, as people whose only real function was to reproduce, um, everything to do with their health was, was defined by their womb. So if a woman was ill, they believed... You know, they had these ideas about, that your womb was like wandering around your body. So if you had stomach ache, it was because your womb had like moved around and was, you know, interfering with your stomach and, and the, all, you know, all these kinds of strange ideas. And, um, you know, obviously medicine has moved on a long way since then. But hysteria has kind of persisted. It's, you know, it's changed in a lot of ways over the last 6,000 years. Um, so Freud, obviously, most famously, has has kind of taken the idea of hysteria and and made it very much a sort of psychological issue. Mm. But again, it's still very wrapped up in, you know, it's, it's all to do with women's minds being weaker and 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 you know it, there's all this kind of stuff where it's wrapped up with like women's sexuality and you know ideas around hysteria being caused by you know women failing to marry and and all you know all of this kind of stuff you know the, there used to be this idea that miscarriages were caused by hysteria for example so throughout history there's been this kind of changing but ever kind of persistent link between hysteria and women's bodies women's minds um you know this idea that we are fundamentally ill you know mm. essentially um and when you think about the fact that medicine has sort of taken male bodies as their default throughout history um female bodies have been seen as the other um and and it, there is very much this idea that they are broken that there's something wrong with female bodies because they're not like male bodies um so yeah so so that was kind of and it's it's a really complex history obviously and that's mm. a very simplistic kind of overview um there's a really fascinating book called unwell women by elena cleghorn who goes into the whole history in much more detail she's a cultural historian and it's fascinating um but that you know essentially is is where it came from this idea of hysteria that has just been so embedded and it's it's only 40 years ago that it stopped being an official diagnosis that's what i mean is like how can something of six thousand years only just 40 years ago kind of you know stop being an actual diagnosis for somebody it's it's that is the bit that got me i was like what you know <laughs> and it's in this recent more recent age you know when you think of like we were saying before you know women in the menopause in the 
30s, 40s, 50s and 60s who were, you know, sent to actual institutions and were given electric shock therapy and their behaviour was hysterical or they were suffering from hysteria. All these things that is only really, really just kind of, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's very recent history that that stopped being used towards women. And it's no wonder then that we're still having to face, you know, a particular set of people that are making us feel, you know, it's, it's gaslighting us basically, you yeah. know, making yeah. us feel like yeah. we're stupid or we're crazy or we're mad or, and and do you think it's about kind of keeping us in our place that there needs to be like this system of power with the healthcare system? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that is, that is the whole of kind of the patriarchy in a nutshell, mm. isn't it basically? Um, but I think, you know, particularly when you look at sort of reproductive health, there is so much around autonomy and agency and control of women's bodies. These like this idea that medicine knows what's best for you, um, and that you should just kind of be quiet and go along with it. Um, so yeah, you know, I, th- I think there's a huge thing about about keeping women in their place, about you know, shutting women down who are not behaving. In- in the way that society expects them to do. I think, you know, a lot of what women were diagnosed for hist- with hysteria for in the past was, you know, literally like not doing what their husband said and mm. it's, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, women who were being difficult were historically diagnosed with hysteria. So I think, you know, we still see such a kind of, shadow from that you know such a such a big influence still in in the way that medicine operates and also with politics as well you know like you women you know if you look at female figures or um you know the, the, oh they're being hysterical or they're emotional or they're yeah. to this they're to that when yeah. I, they're just yeah. being themselves essentially and you know um we were talking before about um women's bodies being politic politi- i can never say this word politicized <laughs> and if you look at what's happening in America, I mean, that, you know, just the turn of events and the turnaround and the shift that's happening there now in 2022 is really quite frightening. But women are still being used to win, you know, votes, basically. The, if Oh, yes, well, if you vote for us, we're going to ban this or we're going to do this. I mean, it's just so wrong. And I feel like we are, well, they are definitely going backwards, but that's opening up so many avenues for other people as well, you know, other other rights that have been taken away. And it is still that thing of put, keeping us in a, in, a, in a position where we don't have as much power, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we... The, the situation in America is, is really frightening, actually. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, we can't be complacent about it. And I I talk in the book about the fact that, you know, abortion is the single most politicised healthcare procedure on the planet. I can't think um, of any other really um, that that just gets, you know, quite as political as, as it does. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and I think what we see a lot is that where progress has been made um in recent years in recent decades um that there is you know there's a pushback you know Mm. in in some cases i think it's it it, it's almost it almost kind of feels like a sign of how far we've come in some ways um but at the same time like you said it feels like such a massive backward step you know that we've taken you know two steps forward and then three steps back um yeah it's it's really frightening and i don't you know i I feel like I think a lot of us in the UK feel just totally helpless looking mm. at what's happening in America and thinking like, how can this happen? And what how, can, how can it be happening in this decade? You know, yeah. like you think we've made so much progress and the idea that we could be stepping backwards um, is just, like you said, completely terrifying. It, it very much, you know, I, I know it's kind of like, it's very like The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood, mm. you know, and, and obviously when she wrote that book, you know, way back when, but actually now so many of those things that are just sl- slipping in, you know, quite insidiously just like yeah. seeping into society. And you think it's, it's obviously like a way of control because things yeah. have got yeah. 
not out of control for some of us. Some of us feel more liberated than ever. But for, you know, certain systems, for the patriarchy, it's very much kind of, oh, we're losing losing a bit of control here. Everybody's free to do what they want. We need to rein everybody back in. And that is a really scary thing. And again, why I love the idea of your book being you know, the rebel, the revolution. And I know, like you've said, this isn't just really about your revolution. This really much, very much is about so many different marginalized communities, Mm. people, and how together we need to keep those conversations going. Particularly, I suppose, here at the moment in the UK, we're not quite, I don't think, as bad as America just yet, but we do need to, as you said, not be complacent and keep those conversations going. How, um... How, what do you think you know t- to move forward then what what are the next steps is it keeping that dialogue going is it you know forming groups is it working with your local practice yeah I think there are loads of layers to it so as I say I think you know there are things that people can do as individuals you know in terms of advocating for themselves advocating for friends and, and relatives but I think also you know the ultimately the change needs to come from the top it needs to be top down we need to be putting Mm. pressure on the people that have the power to really affect the meaningful kind of structural change because there's only so much that patients can do kind of tinkering around at the bottom so we need you know we need government intervention we've got the first ever women's health strategy which was published last summer which you know is in itself a positive step in the right direction that you know these issues are on the political agenda we need to really keep up the pressure to ensure that the government is held to account and that those commitments are met over the next 10 years um you know we need to look at kind of academic res- institutions mm. and researchers and medical schools and you know which subjects are being prioritized in terms of research what is being taught on medical school curriculums what's being taught actually in secondary schools like you said you know what are we teaching girls and boys and you know what are we teaching our children about health and health literacy and and about their bodies um so I think you know there are so many different fronts that we can kind of work on and I think that was another thing that I really wanted to highlight in the book was that you know there are so many different ways of approaching this and Mm. you know if your particular area is menopause here are some campaigns that already exist and here are some things that you can work on and if your particular area is this or you know people need to kind of work to their strengths I suppose and, and work where they are so you know if your job is in hr for example you can look at what your company is doing to you know do they have menopause leave policies do they have you know good sick leave policies what's you know how are you supporting chronically ill employees how are you having these conversations in your workplace do you have a culture where people feel safe to talk about these issues and to ask for support um so yeah i think it it really is about kind of showing people that wherever you are whatever your area of interest whatever your kind of situation in life there are little things that you can do um but you know ultimately a lot of it is going to take money it's going to take funding it's going to take policy change um and yeah that that also you know just needs to come from the top and that's scary though, like you say, when it comes down to money, because then you have this whole thing about privatization. And is that the way forward? You know, I'm seeing so many now private healthcare adverts on the television that I never saw before. Mm. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, it's quite scary. And I've had a few friends recently in the last year or so who've ended up going private, whether it's for menopause care or whether it's been for diabetes or all kinds of different things or because they've not, they've had to sit on a waiting list for so long that they've ended up going private. And then that worries me then. Then I do feel a bit nervous about that because like, you know, not everyone's going to have access to that. So we do... I sometimes feel like, are we being pushed down that road? Are we being pushed towards privatization? So we do really need to work together, don't we, to make sure that we are protecting, you know, what we do have as an NHS to make sure it is working and that we we're not bashing and we're more so working towards, you know, working together to create a better, uh, just a, a better service for everybody because... I think I for one think it would be a very sad thing if that's the route that we went down privatization what do you think 
I know absolutely and as I say in the book you know the the situation that the NHS is in now the absolute kind of crisis point that we've reached is a result of political choices Mm. it is a result of underfunding and that was a political choice by the current government and I think we can't ignore that and we can't you know if you look at all of the junior doctors striking at the moment midwives have been striking nurses for better pay and better working conditions because they are at breaking point and i think we have to we have to do whatever we can to support those people and to make it really clear to the government that we're not going to accept this kind of creeping privatization that's been happening over the last decade Mm. we need to really fight for the nhs um you know because i think there is almost kind of a complacency again that you know we will always have the nhs and you know but actually you know we can't take it for granted we need we need to be able to fight for it and we need to be able to to stick up for it and to it's really difficult to know and again i think it's it's somewhere where a lot of people feel really helpless what Mm. can we do you know we don't have the power we you know it's all in the government's hands um i mean at the next general election you have the power yeah um, for for one thing but you know in the here and now supporting striking healthcare staff i know it's a massive inconvenience and it disrupts healthcare but it is going to be a much bigger inconvenience and a much bigger disruption if we lose the nhs and we are it just feels like we're right on the brink and it is terrifying um I mean, if you look at the pandemic, you know, we was we were so lucky really in this country. I mean, what we put our, you know, medical staff through, you know, and they were there and they stood up and we banged our pots and pans for them and they were absolute miracle workers really and what they did and putting themselves out there. But yeah, it's still this very complex kind of patient, you know, doctor nurse relationship, like you've said, where we we just it's almost like a marriage. We need to kind of just keep talking and keep working yeah. together and keep because we want to protect them as much as they want to look after us. And we don't we like we were saying we certainly don't want to see a privatization in this country. I personally don't. You know, I want to keep our NHS, yeah. and I have Absolutely. friends who are nurses and doctors, and and there are great nurses and doctors out. There 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 really are yes there might be some that are difficult or are still of an old school kind of mentality you know like you were saying earlier about that power kind of balance but having those conversations with your doctor going in feeling armed all the things that you talk about in the book of how you can kind of you know have some autonomy some agency and go right I've had my I've kept my diary this is what's been happening this is what I'm coming to you with and build Mm -hmm. that patient doctor relationship so then everybody's protected everyone yeah. you know and, and I think that is for me that's the way I see it moving forward and going down the education route as well and making sure that you know from a very young age children know kind of what to expect with their bodies or what they should be looking out for or diet on exercise all of those things yeah absolutely and I think the other thing that I really wanted to highlight and this is why you know the final chapter is is kind of a bit more focused on the issues that healthcare professionals face is actually I really feel like we need some more empathy that goes in both directions yeah you know because as you say post pandemic you know healthcare staff are really burnt out Mm. they have done so much for us over the last few years and you know we like you say we stood in our gardens and banged our pots and clapped our hands for them but what they really need now is better pay better working conditions they need us to support them they you know they don't need all of these you know headlines about oh gps still aren't seeing patients face to face and you know i think that there's so much kind of frustration sometimes on the patient side that oh i can't get an appointment and this that and the other that is not your gp's fault your gp Mm. is working so hard under so much pressure um so yeah i think really just some empathy some understanding of the limitations within the system that you know you could have the best most compassionate most empathic gp on the planet and they are still limited in what they can do because of the system because of the government because of funding because of commissioning decisions um and and that's a political issue that's not 
you know something that your where your gp is withholding care it's like you said it's it's very much the the politics really like filtering down and because doctors are human patients are human yeah. and yeah. sometimes we dehumanize people you know whether it's the patient that becomes a stat whether it's the doctor that's like just a pain in the backside we oh. the, the human element of it gets lost and it's very hard if you're especially in the circumstances that you would probably normally go and see a gp you know or, or go in it, you must be frightened or worried or concerned about something so you're already kind of yeah. on the back foot and then you know the, the doctor who's probably seen god knows how many patients that morning and we need to have that kind of human empathy across Mm. all levels and put really the pressure like you were saying on the government to to say kind of right we won't stand for this these things need to change we've got all this evidence here this is what's happening do something about it and I love the fact that the book is a bit of a call to arms for that you know, is kind of galvanizing everyone to come together and actually putting that challenge to the government and having that bit of ownership so that we can feel more um, compelled with a really decent kind of healthy argument to go and say, right, okay, like you were saying, next general election, I know what I'm doing, I know how I'm voting and giving people that understanding. Um, just before I go, um, so we have to kind of finish things up. It's, I could literally sit and talk to you for hours and hours about all of these different <laughs> things. You know, what? what is next for you? What, like, what? where do you see yourself? Will there be a, a, a kind of a follow-up to the book or is there, are there other projects that you're involved in now? Yeah, so people keep asking me about book two. Um, and I mean, the honest answer is I'm not sure just yet. Um, I'm very much still in like full on promotion mode for this book. Um, I've got loads of events lined up this summer um, and just actually really enjoying having these conversations and sort of seeing what is coming out of this book. Um, and I suppose keeping an open mind about about where I want to go from here. Um, obviously, you know, I'm back to freelancing as well. Um, so writing about women's health um, in all sorts of different kind of from all sorts of different kind of angles um but yeah book wise um yeah just focusing on this one for the time being and 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 you as a mom (laughs) you know obviously we, we mustn't forget that you know the fact that you are juggling motherhood as well how how are you looking after yourself like what's what are your go-tos for you to to make sure that you can juggle all of this activity and you know whilst being a mom yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I don't think I've been brilliant at it so far. Um, certainly since the book came out, I have really struggled actually to find mm. time for everything. Um, and I've actually just taken these last couple of weeks off because I reached a point, I, I, March I was doing three events a week and I was just so exhausted oh and gosh, so burnt yeah. out. Um, and so I literally just have taken the last two weeks off um, and caught up on sleep, caught up on reading, caught up on all the jobs around the house that had just been completely neglected since January when the book came out. Um, But yeah, I think going forwards, more of that, more time with friends, you know, just taking those moments where I can trying to get back into exercise I don't know how mums have time for exercise <laughs> well what you should do is do it with the baby like what, what I used to do is when I was like jiggling the baby up and down I used to do like little squats and things nice. like that at the okay. same time I was like this is a really good use of my time yeah. and you then do like baby get dumbbells. really strong uh, strong arms <laughs> and strong legs and as the, the little one gets older and they start to like one and two and they get heavier you get better arms so like <laughs> don't you doing enough exercise trust me you're all right like just but just you know factor it in kind of when you're doing your everyday jobs because you don't want to be having extra extra things to do unless it's going to be for your time out as well and therefore a walk is good (laughs) definitely working uh, working on the old work-life balance definitely figuring it out as I go along but oh well Sarah it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and honestly this book is just to show everyone it honestly it is absolutely amazing it's you should be I, i'm sure you are but you should be so proud of it and you know i really do hope it finds its way into all the secondary schools because it really should be in there for people to study it's absolutely brilliant 
thank you and thank you for having me if you'd like to keep up with sarah and her hysterical women blog or subscribe to the newsletter you can follow her on instagram at sarah graham seven writer sarah's brilliant book rebel bodies is also available online and in all good bookshops i like i said i highly recommend it for more well-being fashion and beauty you can visit us at our website www.thecapsule.co.uk where you can also catch up with our previous podcast episodes by visiting the in conversation page or subscribing to any of our podcast channels and youtube as always please do feel free to leave your rates and reviews it's always lovely to hear from you and you can also leave us a message on our social channels at official capsule it would be lovely to hear your thoughts on the book on this episode or on any other um chats that we've had so please do feel free to drop us a message i will be back next week with another very special guest so all that's left for me to say today is goodbye so it's goodbye from sarah thank you bye and goodbye from me bye bye